And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another Mindset Podcast interview with one of my favorite guests who I had on this last year, Dr. Sharice Johnson. Dr. Sharice Johnson is the uh, author of Expired Mindset, Expired Mindsets, and her most recent book, her most recent book, ladies and gentlemen, Get Off the Scale and Heal. So I'm super stoked to have Dr. Johnson on again on the podcast. Uh, she's a psychotherapist. She helps people from all walks of life. Um, heal their past traumas, build a better mind. And when we build a better mind, we can also, in a sense, build a better uh, body as well, right? Because a lot of times what you see on the outside um, sometimes take t sometimes is is uh, takes time to build, you know, it's it's been built from what's on the inside. So welcome back, Dr. Johnson. Happy to have you on the Mindset Podcast today, again. And uh, today's episode is episode 102. Wow. Episode 102. First of all, congrats. That says so much. I can't believe it's been over a year, but I'm happy to be back and pick up where we left off. Absolutely. And one of the things that I want to talk about, like just, you know, talking about your new book sure. is a lot of, you know, individuals in the health and wellness community. I even lump myself in there mm -hmm. is um, a big challenge that people have is they feel like if they look a certain way, and they get to that level of the way they want to look. They're like, you know, chiseled, rock solid abs, mm -hmm. huge chest if you're a guy or if you're a girl, like, you know, big booty, toned legs. But then on the other side of that, so physically, you might look and feel a certain way. You're like, oh, wow, I feel great. But mentally, internally, you're you're like, oh, my God, like, I look, I look great. I feel great. But mentally, I feel out of sync. Mm -hmm. So... Can you speak a little bit to that of like, you know, sure. how, you know, the health and wellness space, it's, you know, yeah, they encourage like positive habits, healthy eating, regular mm -hmm. movement, but mm -hmm. sometimes what gets often what gets neglected is the mental component. Yeah. You know, get off the scale and heal is centered around the concept of just because you look well, doesn't necessarily mean that you are well. You know, if we think about it, a lot of us also want to look a specific way. Yes, because it might be something that we aspire to, but it's also a way that we want to be perceived and we want people to think that we, because we look a certain way, that we have it all together. So the whole premise of the book is really taking the time to make sure that you understand the motivations behind your wellness habits and that they are coming from a healthy place. And I think that that can be really important when you have something that happens in life that causes a shift or a change. You get married, you have an injury, you move, you get a new job. And if you're overly identified with a certain amount of rigidity and then you need to be more flexible, you may not be mentally well because you feel like I can't do what I've always done, what is happening. So really making sure that things are congruent. You're you're smiling. So that tells me you're like, oh my gosh, I feel I, that. <laughs> I totally have done that. And I'm it's something I've been really continuing to work on. Um mm -hmm. and it's not easy because like I come from a an upbringing where my dad's got, you know, cleaning OCD. Mm -hmm. And I kind of inherited a portion of that, but on the eating and training side, I felt like, oh my God, like if I miss a gym session, I'm going to wither away and there's going to be nothing left to me Yeah, be because I was always a very kind of not frail, but very, you know, very thin, like athletic kid. And I grew up playing a ton of sports. Um, but I got to a point where I'm like, oh my God, like I've been running so much. I've been like, there was a point where I was running like 30, 40 K a week and it's just, wow from soccer and lacrosse and basketball is playing all these sports at the same time. But I got to a point at the end of high school was like, Oh my God, I want to put on some weight. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like I, you know, cause like, yeah. I, like my dad went to the doctor at kind of a similar age in high school and he's and the doctor's like, well, Doug, you gotta, you gotta kind of cut up, cut down and yeah. cut out some sports. Right. Yeah. And I see that all the time with athletes, yeah. I, with a lot of athletes and, you know, they are constantly having to focus on, I need you to increase the amount of food that you're eating when you're training for something and then how to balance that out. You, I wonder if you are similar too. I have a lot of people that I work with that are athletic and their appetite parallels their activity. So they kind of struggle 
when yeah. they're not doing that 30, 40 K a week, they don't have the same appetite. And yeah. that can really then mess with you mentally, because if you're not getting enough, you're not going to sleep well, your emotions are going to be different, your clarity, your train of thought. So that's where you really have to look at a more comprehensive idea of what does it mean to be healthy? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like, uh, you know, your book, it, it, it speaks to that. And, it, and uh, like your philosophy is like, it's not about, it's not about scale. It's not mm -hmm. about how you look And And I've really made that transition. And I want to, mm -hmm. you know, be, let people know that, like, even if you're a little bit more obsessive, or you're, you feel you have to be more rigid, rigid, mm -hmm. you know, that it's okay to think like that. But at the same time, my wife has also taught me, Alex, you're not a professional athlete, you don't need to <laughs> train or relax. eat like you can relax a little bit you're not getting you're not getting paid millions of dollars a year to train eight to nine hours a day yeah if you're a professional athlete it's a little different story you're that's your career that's what you have to do that's what you get paid to do so mm -hmm. but still you know being an ex-athlete I still have that kind of like I feel like I have to even though I'm not in that sure. space yeah and it, it's but it's your gotten, habit. exactly but it's gotten a lot better but my biggest thing I was taught was movement is the best medicine and it can solve a lot of challenges and you know flip flip the script like give your brain 180s to help you yeah. change your inner state so you you can respond better yeah um, and movement is top notch when it comes to medicine and a support we see that in research we see that in practice that fine line is also knowing just like you said and just like your wife is encouraging you how to be flexible with yourself so that you also don't overtrain, get an overuse injury, have a moment where you're actually burnt out on doing the same activities. We see that a lot. And I want to, you know, go back to something that you mentioned earlier, because I think a lot of times when we're talking about like body stigmas, we often think of people that are in larger bodies, but we overlook that there are people who were very thin and small growing up. And that came with its own set of connotations, especially I think as a male, you know, we see that a lot. So sometimes that whole desire of, I want to keep my muscle mass. I want to bulk up also is I don't want to feel the way I felt before. I don't ever want anyone to look at me that way. And that can sometimes keep us you know, doing a lot of really hard activity because we're like, I don't want to be the way I used to see myself anymore. Yeah. And I think a lot of it also stems from because I was like bullied. And when I did start sports, I was literally, I was last, I was last place in running. So it's like, yeah. I felt like I had to prove everyone and I felt like I had to play catch up for a while yeah. before mm -hmm. I started annihilating at every, everyone. Like mm -hmm. I was like, okay. I'm not going to be dead last forever. Like it's going to yeah. change. And it took years of training, but it was like four or five years. I was very young. I was very young. So mm -hmm. that's all I had to focus on was, was like, you know, training and sports and stuff. But that's kind of why that's never gone away is because I was always the kid that yeah. was a little bit undersized, not, not super big, not super small, but you know, very fast, but you know, I was muscle bound, but I still didn't feel like I was at where I wanted to be. So I always yeah. felt like I was lagging behind and I hated that feeling of like feeling like mm -hmm. I'm like behind and everyone's like light years ahead of me. That's all it took for just to like the fire to just be ignited and for me to want to, it just drove me to just punish myself in training. Yeah. And in some ways, I hear that that drive was beneficial, right? At a certain point in your life, it helped you go, I can get better and I'm willing to do the work to get better. It's really like a classic example of an expired mindset. But then you get to a point in life where you have to go, I can't keep that same thought process Process yeah. in mind. This is no longer a strength. Like people want to spend time with me and I want to spend two and a half hours a day. I'm exaggerating, you know, yeah. doing yeah, yeah, a yeah. routine. And then it it's no longer needed as a skill, you know, to that degree. Yeah. So finding balance. Absolutely. And like with your background as well, helping people, again, shift their mindset, mindfulness, meditation, kind of the spiritual mm -hmm. side of things. What are what maybe let you know since the last time we chatted? What are some things that have kind of shifted for maybe some of your patients, your clients, yeah. um, of things maybe break breakthroughs on things that they've let's say struggled with in the past, but they just 
they just did a few tweaks to their routine mm-hmm. or added something in or or remove something that wasn't serving them. And then they're like, boom, oh. aha. Yeah. Probably one of the biggest shifts that I've seen across quite a few clients, whether that's one-on-one or even like in organizations, is their willingness to give themselves more what we call cognitive flexibility and really recognizing that there is a lot of security in a routine. Routines and vital habits are very important. They're helpful for your brain, but we also need the space to have that level of flexibility. So I've really been encouraging individuals to go have your mindfulness practice, but also give yourself permission to go, depending upon how your day lands, it might need to happen at a different time. Or it might need to be a shorter amount of time because I do think people who tend to kind of flow in that spiritual rhythm want it to ebb and flow the exact same way every day. And then they feel super off if they can't follow. And then it's become more of a bondage than, you know, an open opportunity. But that tweak of being more flexible and going this is something that I get to do and it doesn't matter when I do it, even workout wise, yeah. knowing that different seasons, depending upon what's happening, you may not have the same amount of time, but do what you can and then make up the rest of the time later. And that just really opens up um, the room for them to release some of the perfectionism around yeah. Yeah. this is what I love. I, I really like that because there was a point where I was really like, I still am deep in the meditation and really been working on that for years. But um, I feel like I like same thing. I was getting, you know, becoming too much of a perfectionist again and like wanting to be like rigid, like 20 to 30 minutes has to be 20 to 30 minutes every morning. But a lot of times when you're stressed at work and stuff or your business and there's a lot going on, a lot of personal stuff going on, um, you can't, I physically can't be at that rigid. It's just not working or serving me. So Mm -hmm. I had to adjust that and because I still need to keep my mindfulness practice in because I know it helps me mentally for the day, no matter what goes on. So I'm Mm -hmm. like, okay, I got to just dial back the time and still that way I still stay consistent, but I'm not like, you know, 10 to 15 minutes is better than zero, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the key, what you said, you recognized, I don't want to completely let it go because it makes such a difference in my day. And I do have a set of people that struggle there. So my all or nothing thinkers struggle with, it has to be all this way or I can't do it. And so really just getting everyone to move towards that midline is actually a really beautiful space. It's it's not gray. It just gives you room to go in and out. And like you said, if you can't do the 20 or 30, five or 10 is just yeah. as effective because it's the consistency yeah. that helps your neural pathways, not just the frequency in terms of or the, how long you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been, that's something that I've been really working on. And again, my wife's helped me with that because Mm -hmm. she's helped me alleviate some of my perfectionism, like traits and ideologies. And because I, you know, it just, it just, it just causes you more harm than, than good. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, and something that you mentioned that really resonated with me in our last interview last year was about, I'm going to find it. It was a quote I wrote down. Yeah. 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 So the mind is like a parachute and it only mm-hmm. works when it's open. So can yeah. you elaborate on that a little bit more? Cause I know we yeah. touched on a few pieces, but I want, I want to hear. Sure. From you. Yeah. You know, when we think about the concept of mind being a parachute and open, that is one of the most helpful things that we can do for growth, for our ability to develop as a person or to also have Um, different perspectives. I've been talking to people a lot recently about the concept of giving themselves permission to evolve, to intentionally decide you have the opportunity to change. There are certain parts of yourself that will always be where you are. But as you move through different seasons in life, you have to be open. And you think of someone who is like, oh, I'm jumping into something new. I'm getting off of this plane. But if they don't open their parachute, it's going to be a really hard landing if they're like, I'm just holding on tight. But when they open it, it allows you to take in new information. It allows you to learn. And that's the space where you can go, okay, 
I might need to drop weight, so to speak, symbolically. I might need to let go of the things that don't serve me well. And that's going to allow me to fly a little higher, you know, using that analogy. But an open mind while staying centered to your values is one of the most helpful balances that we can have around mental well-being. Yeah, I like that. Because again, it's like, uh, over time, like you're talking about the seasons of life, there is some things that I've had to change going from, yeah. you know, like common law or going to single and then common law relationship and then to marriage, right? There's this thing yeah. that just have to change and yeah. that you want to, and that you want to improve. And like one of those is communication, how you communicate with one mm-hmm. another. Mm-hmm. And I'm someone that I'm a huge like proponent and advocate for uh, mental wellness. And, and mm-hmm. I'm someone that utilizes therapy because I'm still trying to figure it out, but I'm trying mm-hmm. to get a formal diagnosis. I think that I'm on the spectrum of ADHD just because mm-hmm. of like how I think and, and, and speak and all mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So, um, but, and my therapist is actually, a, she has ADHD. So I'm a neurodivergent, so I can, yeah. I can relate to that. And it is definitely a different way of life and a different way of thinking. And, you know, it's interesting because if we connect back to where we started, I find that a lot of my high functioning clients who are neurodivergent do use rigidity to keep themselves together. So it's their yeah. coping mechanism, yeah. especially if they've chosen to go a non-medicated route that they're like, this pattern is what keeps me motivated and activated. And they don't always do as well when things are off or different. So it can be very scary to yeah. let some of those things go. And you only want to let go if you are a neurodivergent a certain amount because you do need the consistency and you do need the anchors. Otherwise you can feel very scattered and like, I'm not accomplishing anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. Because one, one pattern that I've been trying to change in the, in the past that I'm getting better at and it's taking me a long time is like, it was all through my twenties. And I was like, Oh my God, I look back and it's just like so much, so (laughs) much pain, (laughs) pain and challenges. And one of the things was when things got really, really hard, like, I was like, I would get scatterbrained and I like, you know, and let's say I'd be a year or a year and a half and do a job. And I would just, I felt like I'm like, I got to quit. I got to give up. I got to move on to something else. This isn't serving me. Yeah. Because I thought it was just like the, the job. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've been trying to improve because it might not necessarily, it's it's not always necessarily like the, the workplace or the job is sometimes is like just things that I just need to shift mentally. Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. one thing that my parent, my therapist talked about was, uh, it's like a phobia or a fear of a perceived fear of rejection, like, mm-hmm. or, or the, or the way that someone, uh, judges you or like, let's say they're giving you constructive criticism. And then I take it. So it's like, Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, where you kind of replay it in your head over and over. Yeah, and it's just like, and it's like a movie and it just doesn't shut off for me. Like, like other people, like they, if it's like water, water off a duck's back, they keep moving forward. But for me in the past, I'm getting better. But in the past, it's like, I just keep hearing that criticism over and over and over again. And it's like, so that's why, like, and I'm already very hard on myself anyway. Yeah. So when someone else criticize me and stuff like that. I take like it so, yeah. yeah, I take it yeah. so personally. And I've so I've learned that, you know, it's not they're not necessarily taking a jab at me. Yeah. They're just trying to let me know of like, you know, they're, you know, now I've reframed that mindset of like, oh, you know what? Just because they're sitting down to to be give me constructive criticism, it doesn't actually yeah. mean that I'm doing bad. Right. They just know that I have the capacity to do better. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm just not there yet. Yeah. So I hear you exploring as you talked about maybe how you've grown up and then how you, you know, your former athletes, athletes tend to be very meticulous. There's only a right way to do things and expect a lot of out of themselves. All of those things can tie together. And I will tell people, so sometimes it's something that we need to shift, right? It might be our work to do with managing criticism. But there are moments where we're in an environment that is too activating 
for us because a lot of both non neurotypical people and neurodivergence. And whenever I say neurodivergence, I'm talking about ADD or ADHD for those listening can have different moments of stimulation. But when that happens and we take things in, in a way that we can't receive well, we go into what's called dorsal vagal shutdown. And that is that part of us where we go into freeze. I don't want to talk. I feel really defeated. I'm quiet. I don't want to be here. What are people thinking of me? Kind of that that fear and that perception. So there's a balance to also knowing, am I in an environment that knows how and is willing to speak to me in a way that I can receive it? And that just might mean like if I was your manager that I would need to say, Alex, here are all the things that I think are phenomenal about the work that you do. And here's this one piece that I feel like if we make some tweaks, you know, you could really just kick it to the next level. So it's also knowing when you're in an environment that's too harsh and then it activates you and you're like, yeah. I'm not recovering well in that space. Absolutely. And do you see uh, like people that are, that have ADD or ADHD or some of your patients or clients, like- mm-hmm any case studies or examples of uh, people in that space that for career wise, are they, is there a lot of them that are in sales? Cause I'm in sales, but I, I'm learning about myself as I grow yeah. up. Like mm-hmm. I don't feel sales is suiting my personality. It's yeah. it, it puts me continually in continually in a fight or flight response. More. Yes. So I've really been trying to, it's unfortunate because it, it pays well, right? It, it pays the bills. It's a it's a lifestyle that I created and cultivated because I thought it's the road I wanted to go down. But I'm realizing like, um, like I don't necessarily know if it's a forever career. Yeah. Yeah. I might I might have to shift like what I would want down the road. You know, again, depending on my mind and and how everything's going with it. But I would yeah. probably have to shift more into like a different role. That's yeah. not so like every month I need, like I'm used to that pressure. You need certain every... self goals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm yeah. noticing now that it's just not, it's, it's becoming more challenging, like physically and mentally to sustain yeah. that ter- emotional turbulence. Yeah, no, I can definitely speak to that. So since we've talked, and this was just something that we just didn't get into last time because it didn't fit. I do, half of my time is with one-on-one clients. The other half is in corporate wellness. So I spend a significant amount of time talking to organizations and cultures about this very thing. Across the board, I can say this from 10 plus years of experience and studying research around wellness in workplace culture, I do see a significant number of neurodivergents who go into sales because they have this amazing personality that connects with multiple people very easily. They can retain a lot of information about what it is that they're trying to sell. And they also can switch gears quickly in terms of they know how to think on their feet in situations. The challenge to that is that sales is often for them a pressure cooker yeah. Because it creates that constant, like, you may have a day where you're like, I'm actually overwhelmed and really feeling moderately low and like, I need it to be a low key day. But now you're thrust into a role where that's not possible. Every day you're being forced to show up as a certain way. So what I've seen, again, just looking at those I've worked with over the last 10 plus years is a lot of them move as quickly as possible to being regional managers where they can help other salespeople do what they did well, or they do shift out into something different because there's a point where it's one thing to manage that when you're single. It's another dynamic to manage that. Like I need to go home and still have enough left to like, talk to the person in my house <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ring your bell? I absolutely like nailed it yeah um yeah. because sometimes I feel so bad and sometimes I come home and my wife will be talking to me and and she's like Alex are you thinking about work and I'm like uh yeah and mm-hmm. I don't mean to and I don't mean to yeah. it's just like 
that whatever particular day I I'm having a harder time as I'm getting older shutting that down. off and yes just winding the winding down the winding yeah. down part for me is taking way longer especially yeah. if I don't train or move right after even if it's just at the bare minimum a walk right after yes and so I was literally going to say then if we consider what wellness habits would support you you need something to kind of quiet the brain and to yeah. move that energy through. And I often encourage people to have some kind of workday shut down ritual, which yeah. is an opportunity to kind of transition from one moment to the next. That can be really difficult too, if you predominantly work from home. So there isn't that drive home where you can be listening to something and doing some yeah. deep breathing, but getting in 10 to 20 minutes of movement and or meditation, regardless of what you did that morning, will really help interrupt all that excess energy. Again, as a neurodivergent, I have to do the same. I, you know, have been married 25 years. It'll be 26 this wow, year. Oh, congrats. No, That's crazy. awesome. Thank you. Wow, um, we got like married that. very young. I know it goes so fast. I wouldn't trade it for anything. But even I will communicate. So this might be something that's helpful to your listeners. I will communicate to my spouse like towards the end of the day before I even get home, man, today has been activating. I'm probably going to need like 30 minutes of decompression time. So I go ahead and let them know I'm going to walk through the door and not have a lot of words because I'm so overstimulated. I just need to change. I need to go hop on the Peloton for a minute you know, take a breath, do something mindless, and then I'm going to be much more ready to kind of receive your words. Otherwise, it can be really challenging because they're like, you've been giving everybody all your energy all day, but really just let them know it's not personal, but I need that buffer. Right. You know, that's fair. Um, and I, and I've been getting better at that too, of like telling my wife, like, Hey, babe, like I, I just need like 20 minutes. I, I like that immediately as I walk through the door to just move and yeah. A lot of times that's either weights or it's body weight, like hit training or yeah. like, and I've noticed then it's just like, it flushes out that energy, yes. right? Cause you know, the energy can go way up to here. Yeah. A lot of stimulation during the day. And then the only way for me to get it out is through movement. So very true. It just, will take three or four times as long if you yeah. try to just let it hang there. And then yeah. that's uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what was another one I wanted to mention to you? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, any more case studies about, I think we did touch on it a little bit of, but like patients or clients that created a new and improved mindset, mm -hmm. especially some patients or clients in the neurodivergent space that serve yeah. them better. Yeah. So I have one neurodivergent CEO and he and I have been working together for the, the past year. And interestingly enough, similar to what you were talking about, he was very kind of overly consumed with the perception of his staff towards him. And he's super nice guy, but he would definitely coin himself. We would jointly coin him as a people pleaser. So it, it's been a very important for him to have everyone like him all the time. But that can be a conflict when you sometimes need to have difficult conversations. And it doesn't mean that he's an awful person, but people don't like hearing things that they don't want to hear. Or he was finding that he would delay his communication and having conversations that were really important for him to have because he would ruminate in his mind and think through it a million ways to try to figure out what's the perfect way that I can say it so that this person is going to respond. So we really spent a lot of time kind of first getting to the root of where did you stop feeling comfortable saying what you needed to say? Who gave you the message and the, you know, the mentality that, you have to say it perfectly. Um, then we kind of worked through the concept of assertive communication, which just means you're open and honest, um, not mean, but open and honest about what you need to say. And you feel comfortable that what you said was the right thing for you, regardless of the other person's response. And so what that allowed him to do over the course of the year is to really build his confidence up around his voice, his truth, feeling like I did think it through enough that 
I can speak to it from a fair angle, but someone's response doesn't mean they're not pleased with me. And it doesn't mean that what I said was wrong. And that for him has significantly reduced his anxiety and just made him a much better communicator. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, because I feel like that's a big challenge for any manager or leader uh, mm -hmm. or CEO to re relaying maybe difficult information or yeah. un very uncomfortable information to staff, right? Like, mm -hmm. especially information that can potentially jeopardize their role or let's say they're they're underperforming or yes. whatever, and you're trying to do it again in a professional mm -hmm. manner without, you know... Um, making them feel bad or yeah yeah but sometimes they're going to feel bad yeah. because it's a tough situation yeah sometimes yeah. they're going to feel bad because they're really not doing their job but then you know even if we then take that to relationships because it went professional and then became a personal item for him as well because he realized oh I'm doing this in other areas that I'm not always saying what I feel in the moment because I don't want to hurt my wife's feelings. And then it comes up later and she may go, well, why didn't you just, you know, say that before? So it's a process and it's important to know it's never too late to, to shift, to evolve and to create new patterns in our lives. No, I love that. Oh, yeah. I know we touched on this a bit, but uh, like brain capacity and potential. Mm -hmm. I see a lot in literature and articles and stuff like that. There's like one side saying some people are like, oh, you know, your your personality is fixed. But I'm a firm believer that our personality is um, not fixed, but it's like it, it can be molded. It can be crafted mm -hmm. to something better. Sure. Like you still have your, like you said, your core values and principles mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. have grown up with and, and that are, can be quite fixed. Yeah. It can still be changed, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Can, of course you can't change the core of who you are, but you can still evolve your personality and your traits. Right. So yeah. What yeah. So kind of, you have yeah. a fluent capacity to grow, right? That's the whole yeah. concept of neuroplasticity. It is our ability, as long as we are living and breathing, to create new ways of doing things. We may have, we talk about what you're mentioning when we say nature versus nurture. We yeah. may have certain parts of our nature that is inherent to who we are, but as humans, as long as there's nothing wrong with our cognition, we also know how to adapt those things. If we think about it, you know, you talk to people completely different now than you did when you were in middle school, right? Because you have a completely, right, different level of vocabulary. So I always tell people, are you the same person that you were 10 years ago? And they were like, absolutely not. I've changed <laughs> so much. And I'm like, you're proving my point. What I also find, if I'm really honest, is people that tend to lean towards a fixed mindset usually parallel with victim mentality, meaning they appreciate saying, I've always been this way because then it abdicates their responsibility to change. But in truth, we all have fluid capacity to change, to change our response or to know, I know this about my nature. I'm really quick-witted or I'm very strong-tongued. So then we have to decide, well, what kind of practices do I need so that that's not my automatic habit because there's consequence to me being that way. But yeah, it's so important for us to recognize it is never too late for us to shift and grow and change our responses. Yeah, no. And that's, that's something, especially nowadays that the key word that comes to mind for me is adaptability. Like yes, with our response and then, yeah, how we, how we react our response and then how we communicate. Yeah. Ad being adaptable around that. Yeah. And it goes back to that concept around your mind being an open parachute, right? A fixed mindset is going to be parallel to a closed mind. It's my way. It's what I think. I'm not open to hearing anything else. But when we have an open parachute in terms of our mind and that level of adaptability, it means I'm willing to take in new information and shift the way I show up while still being authentic to myself, but also being respectful of it's not just about me. It's also about the people that are in my life that I care about. Yeah. And that's like a big thing 
the shift from going from single to common law to married is it's not about you. It's about us or it's not about me. It's about us. Yeah. And that's a big shift that I had to make because I've always been pretty, you know, selfish, self-centered, like thinking about myself and stuff. But yeah. as soon as we, right, as soon as you add in like a, right, we got a dog and then as soon as you get married, right, you start to, you know, the mindset starts to evolve and I have to evolve with, with, with that and not naturally. And, and because I'm in therapy, I like it because again, it's when you have a professional third party that they see it from the out, see it from, see your thoughts from the outside. And they're like, Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. You said it that way. Maybe yeah. let's, 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 let's let, that that. Again. <laughs> let, 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 re, let's reframe that a little bit differently. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you're like, what, what's wrong now? I will tell you this real quick. I do find that individuals who are single have a more fixed mindset. They have a much more difficult time the longer they've been single to be open because they're so used to things just being focused on their needs by nature. Um, so get a dog, get a spouse, <laughs> you know, just be around people and put yourself in situations that help make you adaptable. Absolutely. But that's all the time we got for tonight there, uh, Dr. Johnson. It was an absolute pleasure having you on the Mindset Podcast again. I would love to have you on the Mindset Podcast again. And where can our listeners connect with you, find you, get to know you a bit better? Sure. The best place to find me is honestly on IG at 